Welcome back to the show. We're joined today with Ron Vellen, who's talking to us about life purpose. So let's come back to primary intention, Ron. Um, help me understand those two words mm -hmm. individually, and then help me understand your theory re uh, behind putting them together. For sure. Well, primary to me means as close as we can possibly come to our essential being. If we were able to ask our own inner self, what is the essence of my existence here? What do we need to focus on? Where do I need, what's my stance in my life? Mm -hmm. Which is not the same as purpose. It's an awareness. It's as primary to me is essentially the most, uh, sort of the pinnacle of that understanding or that first order. Okay. And intention really has to do with our orientation around something. In other words, people will often say, you've, I'm sure heard the expression, the road to hell is... Paved with good intentions. Exactly. <laughs> and I think it's reason why it's paved with good intentions is because people really don't know what those intentions are. Mm -hmm. They're as unconscious as any aspect of our existence. Mm -hmm. And I think the work, when we get to it, when we allow the mind to come onto the side of the self and allow itself to be opened up and transformed, that primary essence, that primary focal point can be revealed. And then the heart's truest purpose is revealed through this intent. And okay. the, it's almost like the heart's finally saying, thank you, you're finally listening. Can we okay. put all these constructs to the side just for five minutes? Of course. We can always come back to them. You yeah. know, and that's the essential part of it. And so I've developed essentially this four-stage process that begins with something that often seems very cerebral, but allows the mind to get all of its desires out, all of its wishes, isms, everything out, so it finally comes to rest and says, okay, I've been heard. I'll let you talk to your heart now. Okay. And that's essentially what happens. So, Ron, the question that comes to mind is, how do you do that? Like, it seems like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Yeah, and so, and then how long does it take? Is this a lifetime worth of learning, no. of, of discovering that essence? How does it work? Essentially, most of my clients have taken roughly three or four months to work on it. And that's not because of a three or four months day in, day out labor. It's just a time for soaking into the insights they receive, allowing them to digest what they're pulling up, and to give them some breathing room. The reality is it's probably a 60, 70 hour process end to end. Okay. And so it could be done in less time, but most people have jobs, they have other things to look after, and you need that space, that soak time to really work it through properly. Okay. So there are four key stages that they go through. The first one is based in a process many people may be familiar with called appreciative inquiry. It's a grounding exercise that simply says, when I'm at my best professionally and personally, mm -hmm. What does that look like? What are the absolute intricate details that come up? What are the circumstances? Who am I working with? And these are very uh, important details on the gross level. So we're looking at what's the environment? Who am I relating with? Uh, what are my uh, values that are in play when certain things are happening? And so we get all of this data and it's a very focused interview process that lasts about an hour. Okay. And we explore all these things and we get a ton of data. We now have all this raw material, we go to the second stage. And this is where we start to distill our values and strengths. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a stage I find, generally speaking, is not done with enough rigor. Okay. So we spend, this is probably, and I often call this part, and I probably shouldn't be saying this, the part where we kind of grind our teeth. Okay. Because people find this part the most difficult because we're trying to break through the leaping into my value must be kindness to humanity or something. And they're noble, wonderful thoughts they're just not very accurate. Mm -hmm. So we drill through our data, we have them do a lot of work, and we pull forward sort of a top five values and strengths that we know exist, that they have experienced, and we know for sure that they are true. There are okay. always gonna be conflicts, but those, those are the top ones. Okay. Then we move to the, sex, the next stage, which is really something that has been done a lot, but we found another sort of twist on it, and that's something we call an experience vision. Okay. Instead of a regular vision, what we do is we look at instead of the, just the things we want or want to see in our life five, 10 years down the road, whatever, we want to now formulate and understand based on our experience, what does that experience actually look like? So houses, cars, boats, family relationships, whatever, mm -hmm. what does it actually give us in the end? And if we're able to enunciate what that experience is, we now have a picture. It sort of becomes like a masterpiece. Okay. So we have this wonderful painting we call an experience vision. Mm -hmm. It's often a page or two long, which for a lot of vision people, they go, how do you remember that? Of you course. don't have to remember it all. Okay. Um, and one of the things we find is, it sort of reminds me of a visit I had to the Metropolitan Museum in New York. I remember standing in front of a beautiful painting of an artist named Velasquez, and I know this much about art, but he's a master, definitely. And I'm watching people that look at this picture from different points of view mm -hmm. and experiencing it in a different way, and that's all valid. It's still part of the same picture. 
Okay. But what we often tend to do is say, wow, this is a masterpiece. It's Benjamin Moore 967 one stripe here and you know, charcoal gray 1186. And you know, we have these two stripes that we can remember, but they've lost all their meaning. Okay. So we sure. keep it whole. So now we've exhausted the mind's desire. Mm -hmm. And now we come to a point, we go, now what? Mm -hmm. Well, now we have to can cut through it. Okay. And this is a proprietary thing that I don't have enough time to explain. Of course, of but course. But basically, we go through a process of, first of all, distilling simple questions. Mm -hmm. Again, going through, why do we want these things? We go through a whole laddering process, going a little bit deeper, and then we get to a point where we work in, into a process that I've developed that allows the mind to let go. Okay. And it's a guided process that reveals a message mm -hmm. for people that actually comes through in a way that is as succinct as a word or two. Okay. That is essentially the primary intention. And it has a, an experience for pretty much everyone that is, it's like a pulsating word or a phrase that then it starts to unpack. There's a term that's often used in Eastern studies called a sutra or an aphorism. Mm -hmm. These are very condensed phrases and teachings that take years to unpack. Mm -hmm. And this is the experience that most of my clients have had. Okay. And so what we try to do is say, okay, you've now been given this message, just let it bake okay. for days, weeks, whatever. And the comparison that people have had, the similar experience people have had is if, when I've watched people come before a master and ask them a question, mm -hmm. the master, if they're a legitimate master, will be able to perceive that question on levels that even the person asking won't even realize. Okay. And they'll get direction. It's a piece of guidance. Mm -hmm. It may mm -hmm. be, go meditate in the meditation cave, go write something in your journal. And people think, oh great, go write something in my journal, that's done. And they find out months later, Oh, that's what she meant. And then there's another layer and it keeps un unpacking. Well, that was going to be one of my questions that once you walk through the process and you come out with, um, as you said, the one word, or if you come out with feeling, okay, this feels like my core essence or my right. purpose um, or my primary intention, uh, what happens then? Do you get through, is that just that current reality of that person? Because it seems like your work is based on current reality. Yeah. Um, more the uh, more so than what the future vision is because yeah. you walk through a lot of current reality you walk through experience as you right. said and you know the the feelings around that uh, the, around that past experience so right. but do you get to a point where you walk out and you say okay this is where I, what I'm feeling right now and then does that change based on five years down the road your mm -hmm. life being different your career being different and then do, do people have to go through that discovery phase again uh, the answer is yes, it evolves, and no, they don't. Okay. I mean, I hope they end up working with me in other ways to refine how they apply it. And that's okay. really the work that follows. But what ends up happening is it kind of moves like a glacier. Okay. We can often not detect that a glacier is moving, but it's moving. And mm -hmm. so what will happen is because this doorway has been opened, it stays open. So okay. people often rely on this phrasing that comes as a way to keep that door open to the heart, mm -hmm. to the self that says, okay, you're listening, we're now communicating. Just focus on this phrase or whatever for the next little while, and it will evolve. And so what happens, it evolves of its own accord because you have that communication kind of ongoing. Okay. What happens with vision is that is, as far as I'm concerned, and most people that do vision work know that it's basically educated guessing. Mm -hmm. It's based on everything I know today, this is what I would like to see happen. And it may complete, be completely valid. What okay. the heart says is, the heart says, that's great. I don't care what you want to do. Okay. If that's your chosen strategy, awesome. This is the primary intention behind it. And then once we finish that, if people want to do it, we can actually go back and phrase it in a way that sounds more purpose-like, okay. which often people do. So we go up this process, we mm -hmm. skip the stage of the purpose, do the primary intention, which is, in my opinion, a much more distilled understanding and essence of what we're about. And then we go back and say, okay, you want the construct of a purpose? No problem. I've done it for my website. I mean, I can, you put things in language that people can connect with. Of course. But for you, it's a matter of, usually a matter of two or three words. Okay. And that's all you need to remember. Now, Ron, in order to leave the viewers with, in closing, what would you like to leave our viewers with that you would like them to remember about primary intention? 